was part of the Army Nurse Corps for three years during World War II. Two of those years spent overseas in England, France, and Belgium. One of the most harrowing periods of my uh, Army service occurred in the weeks leading up to and during the Battle of the Bulge, which was the biggest, bloodiest, and most decisive battle of World War II. Our hospital was a general hospital that held a thousand beds. It was staffed by 50 physicians, dentists, and medical administrative officers, a hundred nurses, physiotherapists, and Red Cross workers, and 500 enlisted men responsible for the upkeep and maintenance of the hospital and to assist the nurses in the care of the wounded soldiers. General hospitals, because of their size and scope of their equipment, were always located 100 miles or more behind fighting lines, uh, and when possible, in a permanent building with running water and electricity, as compared to the much smaller field and evacuation hospitals that were located close to the fighting lines. Um, In World War II, we did not yet have the uh, helicopters they had in later wars that were a godsend in ferrying severely wounded soldiers to a general hospital a hundred miles away or more, so patients frequently died in the long ambulance trip to a general hospital. To rectify this, the Army Department, the, the War Department, Uh, began uh, an experiment, uh, that of putting a general hospital in tents as close to the fighting lines as possible using the triage system. And our hospital was to be part of this experiment. They just forgot to warn us that at some point we were going to be ahead of the fighting lines instead of 100 miles behind them where we belonged. Our hospital unit arrived in Liège, Belgium, on October 11, 1944, after spending the past year in England, where we had set up a hospital and operated that for several months until after D-Day, which was on June 6 of that year, when the Americans crossed the English Channel and invaded the German-held French coastline. About six weeks after D-Day, our hospital unit crossed the English Channel also to debark at Utah Beach. This was a trip that would normally take uh, three to four hours for the 21-mile crossing of the English Channel. It took us three nights and four days because the channel was still clogged with the debris of uh, half-sunken planes and ships from the D-Day invasion of Normandy. We then camped out in a Normandy cow pasture for the next seven weeks, waiting for the Germans to be cleared out of Liège so we could move on up to Belgium and establish our tent hospital and an apple orchard on the outskirts of Liège. Liège was a large, beautiful city of 200,000 inhabitants with the Meuse River running through it and it was spanned by several bridges. It was known primarily as a coal mining area, a music and religious center. It was really renowned for those two things and was especially known as a supply depot because of its huge network of rail lines that went to all the surrounding countries, Germany, Holland, Luxembourg, and France. So this rail line was important strategically for carrying troops and supplies. And it was this rail line that Hitler wanted to destroy when he started sending his buzz bombs into Liège. These buzz bombs, also known as V-1s, later on robot bombs, each carried 2,000 pounds of explosives. You couldn't see them coming at first. You could just hear them put put puttering along in the distance. And then as you look, you'd see a moving black cross, uh, a, a moving black dot, which, gra- which gradually began to look like a, a cross. And in the nighttime sky, you could see tongues of flame issuing from the ends of this cross. 
As the bomb got closer in the sky and the noise of its motor grew louder, you'd start to hold your breath as you mentally urged the motor of that bomb to keep running. Because if the motor shut off before the bomb was overhead, then it would plunge to earth at a 45 degree angle with a horrible whining whistle, destroying everything in its path on the ground for hundreds of feet. Its concussion could be felt miles away. If the motor of the bomb was still running as the bomb passed overhead, then it was safe to resume breathing. But then they came out with another bomb that really fooled us because this bomb had passed overhead and we, did, we started breathing again. But then the bomb made an abrupt U-turn and headed back in our direction. And then they sent bombs that came from three different directions all at the same time. The bombs came over every 12 to 15 minutes, 24 hours a day, and they came for the next two and a half months. Our hospital was hit three times by buzz bombs, causing destruction of hospital tents and casualties inflicted upon patients and hospital personnel. We worked, slept, ate, and went to the latrine to the sound of buzz bombs, either flying over or about to drop. And if one was about to drop, you never wanted to be caught in the latrine tent with four layers of pants around your ankles, <laughs> your combat pants, pant liners, long underwear, and panties. Before even going into that tent, you always paused at the doorway and scanned the sky for any incoming objects. And then you ran in, you did what you had to do and ran out, still pulling up your outer layer of pants. Our patients hated being confined to a hospital bed in Buzz Bomb Alley, which is what they called the Liège area. And to a man, they all said they would rather be back at the fighting lines, where it was comparatively quiet, at least some of the time. Uh, Mel, what sucks? Despite the continual, Despite buzz, the continual buzz bombs, uh, our hospital was going full blast as we admitted and evacuated hundreds of patients a day under the triage system, and our beds never cooled off. Under the triage system, priority for treatment depended upon the severity of the patient's injuries. If the injuries were extremely severe, requiring long hours of surgery and many months of recuperation, then the patient received just enough care to make him as comfortable and pain-free as possible. And within a few hours, he was evacuated to a general hospital in England, France, or the States. If the injuries were such that he could be treated uh, medically and surgically and returned to duty within just a few weeks, then he stayed with us for treatment and rehabilitation. Uh, our operating rooms were going 24 hours a day as we cared not only for our own battle casualties, but for the Belgian civilians as well who were injured by buzz bombs. And these buzz bomb injuries were horrendous for the flying glass shards that were generated by buildings exploding penetrated deep inside the body and they were extremely uh, painful and difficult to retrieve. Not only did we have the buzz bombs to cope with, but then we had the weather. The month of November, Belgium was inundated by heavy torrential rains and our entire hospital site was a sea of mud. Uh, on uh, November 16th, the Americans began a huge offensive against the Germans, and our hospital had to be open and ready to receive casualties, finished or not. And believe me, we were far from finished, because many of our uh, cement floors in the hospital tents had not yet been poured. So we nurses sloshed ankle deep in water and mud on our 12-hour duty shifts, and our feet were always waterlogged. Excuse me. <clears throat> Every tent leaked. We are constantly shifting beds around, trying to keep our patients as dry as possible. The first few weeks, we had no running water in the hospital, but we did have heat in the form of coal-burning pot-bellied stoves, 
and the Belgian coal that we burned through a much warmer heat than the British coke we had burned the previous winter in England. Uh, we had no electricity, though, and the long, dark hospital tents were just barely illuminated by kerosene lanterns and flashlights. When we went from bed to bed giving morphine shots, a corpsman stood at our elbow with a flashlight focused on the site of injection, and the patients poured in with their pale, anxious faces, and so many of them had a P or an S painted on their foreheads in purple junction violet to indicate that they had already received penicillin or a sulfa drug in a previous hospital or aid station before reaching us. Eventually, the rain stopped, and all construction on our hospital was completed. And then on December 16th, German General von Rundstedt made his famous counterattack into Belgium, starting the Battle of the Bulge. Now on this map here, I'll try to show you how the Battle of the Bulge got its name. All territory to the right of this line is Germany. To the left is Belgium. Up here is Holland and Luxembourg and France. Uh, the Americans have become a little complacent the past several weeks due to their rapid advances through all of France and then Luxembourg and now Belgium. And they were, everybody was so sure the war was going to be over by Christmas in two weeks. And the Americans failed to note that the Germans were massing troops and tanks along the Belgian-German border. And when the Germans found two thinly guarded areas, north at Monschau and 84 miles south at Echternach on the uh, Luxembourg-Belgian border, they plunged through into Belgium simultaneously from these two areas, and they formed this bulge. This bulge was 45 miles wide and 60 miles deep into Belgium. Down here in the southern portion of the bulge was a small mill crossroads town of Bastogne. Uh, looking at it uh, on the map, it resembled the spokes of a wheel because of the many roads crisscrossing through it. And these, none of, most of these roads were not paved, they were dirt roads, and which could become quagmires of mud during the rainy season. But they did have seven roads that were paved, and it was because of these paved roads that Hitler had to get control of Bastogne, because they would facilitate uh, entry of his heavy mechanized vehicles it, it, onto the major highways of Belgium so he could reach his desired destination, which was the port of Antwerp. Mel? It was here in Bastogne. It was here in Bastogne where 21,000 Americans were uh, 11,000 alone just from the 101st Airborne Division were completely surrounded by Germans and given an ultimatum to surrender within two hours. Uh, acting American Commander General Anthony McAuliffe gained instantaneous lifetime fame with his one-word reply to the German ultimatum, and that one word was nuts. The German officer who had delivered the ultimatum and spoke a perfect English was perplexed and he asked uh, General McAuliffe's aide, what is the meaning of this word, nuts? The aide replied, it means, go to hell. <laughs> Up here, 54 miles from Bastogne, was Liège, where our tent hospital was located. The German plan was to head on up to Liège. From here, they would cross the Meuse River and head toward Brussels. But they would... They, would bypass Brussels. Instead, it was just a straight run up to Antwerp where they could easily capture the seaport and cut off all Allied shipping. So this meant all supplies, not just for the Americans, but for the British and the Canadians as well. Down here, 25 miles southeast of Liège, was a small little 
a farming village called Malmedy, the site of the infamous Malmedy Massacre. It was here where 140 to 150 Americans were herded by the Germans into a nearby field. And though their arms were raised in the upright position of surrender, they were ruthlessly mowed down or clubbed to death or shot point blank into the head. Many of them had their fingers and hands cut off, not just so the Germans could get their rings and watches, but more importantly because of their warm winter gloves, which the German army did not have. And this was the most bitterly cold winter with the most snow that the Belgians had seen in from 50 to 100 years. Some historians say it was the coldest winter in all of Belgium's history, with temperatures often going down to 30 degrees below zero and more. Not all of the Americans died under the German onslaught, and under cover of darkness, about 40 of them who were still alive were helped by the Belgians or made it on their own uh, to nearby American hospitals. The Americans were completely demoralized by the German breakthrough, and the entire U.S. Army was in a turmoil. Our anti-aircraft shot at our planes, our planes fired on our infantry. Thousands of Americans were captured, thousands were slaughtered, and thousands more were pushed back. German paratroopers dressed in American uniforms were dropped to infiltrate American lines. Other paratroopers draped in white sheets were dropped on snow-covered areas. At this point in time, excuse me, At this point in time, our hospital was functioning like an evacuation hospital, as we were the closest hospital to the fighting lines, and the casualties again just poured in with their faces gray with fatigue, uniforms muddied, bloodied, torn. Sometimes they came wrapped in a blanket, and so many of them had the blackened, blistered feet of trench foot which often led to amputation. We had to have a special tent for trench foot cases because once gangrene set in, the stench from the putrefying flesh was so bad, it sickened our other patients. And our patients' injuries were beyond horrible. It was difficult for the nurses not to display any signs of emotion as we treated these broken, mutilated bodies and would affect an air of nonchalance as uh, we tried to engage the patient in conversation. Hi, soldier, what part of the states are you from? And this was a great question to ask them because they all love to talk about their hometown. Well, don't you worry. We'll have you fixed up as good as new by the time you get out of here. We told a lot of white lies, but we had to give them hope. We listened to the daily news reports of German advances as the Germans got closer and closer to Liège. And then two days before Christmas, as my roommate and I got off night duty, we decided we were going to open our Christmas packages from home that morning, but because surely by Christmas in two days we'd be dead. If we weren't killed by the buzz bombs, then we'd be captured and probably killed by the Germans. So here we were at 8 o'clock in the morning, sitting in our, on our cot beds in our little fifth-floor chateau bedroom, opening the lovingly wrapped gifts from home, packages from home, and eating the homemade goodies that we washed down with our ration of French champagne. We each consumed a whole magnum of champagne that morning, and we had the best sleep that day that we had had in weeks. <laughs> If the entire German army had marched through that little chateau bedroom, we would have been oblivious. By the next day, December 24th, the Germans were 10 miles from Liège. Um, Many uh, or most of the American hospitals in the area had already evacuated back to England or France, 
and we felt like sitting ducks, hoping and waiting for orders to evacuate also that never came. Instead, we nurses were ordered to pack our musette bags with the warmest clothing we had and any first aid and food supplies uh, in the event we were captured by the Germans and to be ready to move out with 10 minutes' notice. Uh, Typically female, the first item that went into those musette bags was the French perfume we had all purchased in Paris several months earlier. And this was followed by our cigarette ration, because a pack of American cigarettes could go a long way for bartering in war-torn Europe. And we were scared, I in particular, because on my dog tags, I had an H for Hebrew, just the very ones who Hitler wanted to annihilate. Our patients were furious that American women were so far up front. And when orders came to evacuate our sickest bed patients that day, uh, uh, they begged us to change places with them. One of my patients was so concerned about my possible capture by the Germans, he constructed a blackjack for me to carry with me at all times, and believe me, I did. And in my right hand, I am holding, you probably can't see it, but I am holding this blackjack that was a 10-inch length of hosing stuffed with lead sinkers and suspended from my wrist by a leather thong. And his instructions were, if a kraut gets near you, slam this blackjack across his face and aim for the eyes. Another patient gave me a spring blade knife, which is uh, shown here in my left pocket. And his directions were, If a crowd approaches, plunge the knife blade into his belly, turn it, and then run like hell. (laughs) That day, as we were evacuating our sickest bed patients to the rear, the fog that had hung over all of Belgium for the past week began lifting, and by nighttime, it had completely dissipated and a full moon arose. This moon was so full and so bright it lit up our hospital area with an almost daytime light, and I stepped outside the tent to take a look. And I was greeted by what seemed to be hundreds of red flares dropping through the nighttime sky. Uh, As I stood there watching, the plane that had dropped these flares began flying lower back and forth across our hospital tents and nearby enlisted men's tents dropping anti-personnel bombs and strafing the tents. I ran back into my tent and told them to get under their beds. I found an empty bed and scrambled under it too, letting out a shriek as I did so. My corps man, who was at the other end of the tent, called out anxiously, Lieutenant, were you hit? No, I called back in a very disgusted sounding voice, only by a loaded duck. In hospital lingo, a loaded duck was a full urinal. (laughs) My patients laughed uproariously at this, and it helped dispel some of the fear and tension that had gripped us all before. As his plane kept flying back and forth, dropping his explosives and strafing the tents, uh, the anti-aircraft battery behind our hospital opened up and began shooting at him, but they kept missing him, and instead we had flak coming through our tents that we certainly didn't need. And eventually the plane, after exhausting all his explosives, flew off into the night. Many patients and hospital personnel were wounded that night. Forty-seven of our enlisted men were wounded, some seriously, and two of them were killed. Our entire day crew came back on duty to work in the operating rooms and surgical tents or wherever needed, and they worked throughout the night and well into the next day. It was a night of horror no one will ever forget. Before going off duty that morning, I uh, stepped over to a nearby tent that held patients too severely wounded to be moved. Uh, I had been visiting this tent each morning and night when coming on and off night duty, as there was a young soldier there 
from my hometown. And though we hadn't known each other before uh, the war, before this time, uh, just the fact that he was from my hometown, Meriden, Connecticut, so many thousands of miles away, and he had gone to my high school. It brought home so close, and we had the most wonderful time talking about all the physical uh, physical aspects of our town. We talked about West Peak Mountain and Hubbard Park Lake and the crazy traffic tower at the corner of Colony and Maine. And it just brought home so close, we, we forgot the war completely. And then when we discovered his mother was a customer in my mother's dress shop, well, that made us practically kissing cousins. And we just had such a good time talking about Meriden. And, and uh, we didn't discuss the fact that he was missing an arm and a leg and one eye. As I entered his tent that morning, I saw with shock, anger, and sorrow his bed and several other beds in line with his were empty. Going off night duty with a couple of other nurses, we straggled down the path to the nurses' quarters, uh, too empty and spent to even talk, as, as the three of us reviewed the scenes of horror from the night before in our own minds. A nurse coming on day duty uh, greeted us in the path with a muted Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. It sounded absolutely ludicrous. We didn't even know what day it was. And it seemed to hit our funny bones all at the same time because the three of us stood there bent over with hysterical laughter for a few minutes. And it was a good catharsis for our very somber mood. Christmas Day had dawned bright and clear. The sun was out for the first time in over a week. Of course, the buzz bombs were out on their 12 to 15 minute visits as they had been during the fog bound week. But our planes were out for the first time in over a week. And so were the German planes. And we watched as they engaged our planes in dogfights near our hospital area as spent machine gun bullets fell around us. We saw flaming planes spiraling to the ground as we silently prayed that they were German planes and not ours. Our, uh, that day, all the chapel tents were filled to overflowing with people who came to pray, but because of the constant flow of the buzz bombs, they couldn't really concentrate much on praying while they were wondering, where is it going to drop? Christmas week was a nightmare because German planes came over every night to drop their, we called them Bed Check Charlie, to drop their uh, paratroopers dressed in American uniforms to infiltrate every American base. These paratroopers spoke a perfect English with no trace of German accent whatsoever, and they had been very well taught American slang. But one subject they hadn't been taught was that of uh, American sports. And when they were questioned by guards as they attempted to infiltrate a base, they couldn't answer such questions as who won the World Series or who's the pitcher for the Dodgers or the Yankees. Time out. <laughs> <clears throat> That same week of Christmas, the prisoner of war compound that was attached to our hospital was searched, and the POWs were found to have a huge stash of knives and guns they were planning to use in a breakout against us. In the months that they had been working for us, the POWs had been very subservient and anxious to please as they did uh, perform their menial jobs they were they that freed up our enlisted men for the more important jobs of caring for wounded soldiers, and the, the POWs carried uh, litters and they shoveled snow and uh, replenished coal buckets and cleaned latrines, and they were happy to be out of the fighting and happy to have a warm bed to sleep in at night and three square meals a day. But once the German breakthrough began. They became very arrogant and surly, and it was this 
uh, arrogance that prompted the search of their compound. As Christmas week drew to a close, more of our planes were seen in the sky, and soon they outnumbered the German planes. The next two weeks, we saw huge, constant waves of our planes by day, thousands and thousands of them, and those of the RAF, the Royal Air Force, at night. And it was the most heartwarming sight and sound in the world to see them and hear them as they flew on their missions to destroy the advancing German army. Thousands of Germans were surrendering and thousands more were captured. As American troops advanced into Germany, they mopped up pockets of resistance and destroyed German buzz bomb nests. By January 25th, the Battle of the Bulge was officially over. In this six-week period, 19,000 Americans had been killed, 47,000 wounded, and 21,000 missing in action, perhaps prisoners of war. We just didn't know. Uh, and uh, though there were many more battles to be fought uh, before the Germans surrendered on May 8th, and we were busy caring for the casualties of those battles, without the threat of being killed by buzz bombs or captured by the Germans, our lives were peaceful and content as we did the job we came overseas to do. At this point, uh, Amer there are uh, Purple Hearts were awarded to uh, members of our hospital staff. There were uh, 47, uh, 53 altogether, which included th uh, three who had uh, Purple Hearts with oak leaf clusters. They had been injured on more than one occasion. And this we had never expected when we first started out. In conclusion, I'd like to say there was no patient on earth as wonderful as G.I. Joe, the American soldier. He never complained. He could lie in bed racked with pain and never ask for medication if he saw that we were busy elsewhere in the tent. And then when we did get to his bedside, he'd always say, take care of my buddy in the next bed first. And G.I. Joe was grateful. He thanked us profusely over and over again for the slightest thing we did for him, and oftentimes he'd grab our hands and kiss them. And G.I. Joe was grateful to be in an American hospital with a bed with sheets sometimes he hadn't experienced for as much as one or two years. And uh, although once in a rare while, I'd come on duty in the morning to find G.I. Joe curled up foxhole style on the cement floor under his bed. And G.I. Joe was grateful for us just being there, American women he hadn't seen or spoken to, sometimes for as much as two or three years. Uh, and G.I. Joe was, un was forgiving and generous to his enemy. When the POWs would enter the tent, G.I. Joe would hold a motion for them uh, to come to his bedside and holding out his pack of cigarettes and indicate that they should help themselves. And as they did so, he'd pull out from under his pillow his packet of precious family photographs and hold them out for the uh, POW to admire as he intoned, my mother, my wife, my daughter. And then after they were duly admired and returned, the POW performed the same act. He pulled from his pocket his own pack of family photographs and held them out for G.I. Joe to admire. Here they were, just two human beings, hungry for family and home. Caring for G.I. Joe, the American soldier, was truly a privilege and one of the greatest experiences of my lifetime. Thank you. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. And then I have some pictures over here that you may want to look at. And... No questions? I have a question. Yes. Have you, I'm right here. Have you been back to visit? Yes. My husband and I went back in 1965, and uh, it was a rude awakening we found the chateau that the nurses lived in. I think I have a picture over there on the table. 
And this was a 16th century chateau. And when we lived there, of course, there was no running water, no electricity, uh, no, no bath, no flush toilets. No, you know, we washed out of a helmet. Somebody would bring a, a, a pail of cold water and you'd get and wash yourself and you'd wash your clothes in your helmet. Uh, so we went back there. The, the chateau was still there. But when we looked for our hospital, our tent hospital, which was in the apple orchard, that was completely gone, and there was a garden-type apartments there. We did look through the deep grass behind the, the uh, chateau, and we found a cement slab, which was the flooring of the officers' club tent. But otherwise, there was no trace of us ever having been there. Did you meet your husband in the war? What? Did you meet your husband? In the oh, war? we met when we were 10 years old. Oh, <laughs> oh, my God. And then we re-met again when I was working in New York after the war, and he had uh, just uh, come back from China and Japan, and uh, that was it. <laughs> yes? So what happened to I'm sorry, I can't hear you. What happened to who? G.I. Joe. G.I. Joe. Oh, what happened to G.I. Joe? Did he go home? Or... The one from your hometown. Oh, the one from my hometown? No. Uh, well, G.I. Joe was all the American soldiers, the name we had for all of them. And they were, they were the best patients. I could never go back to civilian nursing after taking care of them during the war because they never complained. <laughs> yes? Can you talk about your convoy over to France? Oh, <laughs> yes. When, uh, our ship, uh, when we first went overseas, before uh, going overseas, when we got, uh, we got word that, uh, uh, our, that we were ready to um, move overseas, they... Uh, brought the hospital to a staging area for three days, and we were incognito. You couldn't call anybody, you couldn't write, couldn't tell anybody where you were or where you were going. Of course, we didn't know where we were going anyways. They had issued tropical uniforms to us, but uh, three days out at sea, they took them all back and, and issued cold weather uniforms. But anyhow, we sailed out of Boston Harbor on December 28th, and but... Uh, the night before we sailed, I got a phone call, and, and when somebody called out my name, Lieutenant Phillips, you have a phone call, I was petrified because I hadn't told anyone, I hadn't told anyone where I was, and how did anyone know how to get in touch with me in the nurses' barracks there at Camp Miles Standish, so... I answered the phone, and it was my current boyfriend, who was a Navy dentist uh, on a troop transport called the Dorothea Dix. And uh, I was stunned, and he said, don't ask any questions. He said, I'm just calling to tell you you're going to be going overseas in my convoy. Well, this was very exciting for me, and uh, I couldn't wait for us to get aboard ship. And uh, this after... The first couple of days, you know, they indoctrinated us in uh, lifeboat drill and, and what to do and so forth. Then finally, uh, I made my way to the um, uh, communications office of the, and uh, saw these two Navy officers there. And uh, they said, can I help you? And I said, yes, can you tell me? Here we're in a convoy of 60 to 70 ships spread out across the Atlantic Ocean. And um, I said, can you tell me where the Dorothea Dix, that was the name of his ship, is located in this convoy? And the two officers started laughing. They pointed to the one ship in front of us. They said, that's your ship, and the admiral of the fleet is aboard that ship. Well, that was really exciting. Next thing you know, I was at the deck with binoculars looking for him. Of course, there are thousands of them aboard his troop ship, and I never realized that he was down in the dental dispensary drilling teeth or something. So uh, I, uh, I kept looking for him and didn't see him. 
So after another couple of days, I went back to the communications office and uh, gave them my bottle of Canadian Club I had been saving for a special occasion. And I said, would you flash a message over to that ship and tell uh, Harry, that, that was his name, Lieutenant Grossman, that uh, Lieutenant Phillips is aboard the uh, E.B. Alexander. I don't know why they did it, but they did. Anyhow, I ran back to the deck, and everybody was all of our hospital unit. We all stood on deck to watch them flashing the message over to him aboard the Dorothea Dix and said, will you contact Lieutenant Phillips? And uh, she is aboard. And, and two days later, they hand me a yellow telegram, and I have that telegram here. I have pictures of it. And uh, the telegram said, we'll try to contact you ashore. Well, we landed in Liverpool on uh, January 8th, and United Press was there taking pictures of all the nurses uh, loaded down with all their gear and uh, as they disembarked in, in, in Liverpool. You don't see me in the picture because I'm still hanging over the railing looking for Harry. <laughs> <laughs> and he never showed up. <laughs> Anyways, they loaded us in trucks, and we drove off into the night, and they took us to a, a staging area, and we had our first taste of England, and it was cold and wet and damp, and uh, we slept in Quonset huts that were freezing, and everybody immediately developed the English hack. Uh, we coughed and coughed for months. Anyhow, um, after a couple of days, nothing happened. I still hadn't heard from Harry, so... I decided to send a telegram. Once they, uh, the first three days, you couldn't, um, you couldn't uh, make any phone calls or, or send any mail telling people where you were. So when that ban was lifted, then I got some British money and went to the nearest pay phone, and I called the operator and told her I wanted the number for, uh, I wanted to send a telegram to Harry, uh, to the Dorothea Dix and located at the Mercy Docks in Liverpool. Well, I thought that'll get him. Uh, I should hear from him any time now. Well, weeks went by, and finally, six weeks later, I get a scathing letter from him. And he says, what in the world are you trying to do to me? Thanks to your telegram, thanks to your message that was delivered to the Admiral of the fleet aboard our ship, where here we are in the middle of the ocean, and with zigzagging because to evade German submarines all around, and you and, and, and you uh, uh, you sent this message, and if, if the Germans had ever found that message, they could have destroyed the whole convoy. It was pretty serious when you get to think of it. Well, and the, the admiral said, you know, this is a terrible breach of security. And he said, well, I don't think she thought, she knew very much about it, and, and she didn't realize what she was doing, and the admiral said, well, just make sure it doesn't happen again. Well, it happened again when I sent him a <laughs> telegram to, to his ship care of the Mercy Docks in Liverpool. I not only named the ship, but I named the location, too. So again, they called, the, the admiral of the fleet called Harry. He said, well, now I know you're both spies, and, and, and you're, you're going to be courts-martialed. Well, <laughs> so he finally convinced him, I guess, because uh, nothing ever happened. I was never courts-martialed, and he wasn't either. But it was a little hairy for a while. <laughs> And later on, he did get to visit us uh, on our post uh, in England when we were in North Wales. And, of course, seeing this one Navy uniform uh, uh, on this Army post of olive drab, uh, everybody was yelling, oh, the gravy's in the Navy. <laughs> so he got a good reception. <laughs> Any other questions? How did you feel uh, coming home when you saw the Statue of Liberty? Oh, when uh, when the, our ship, when the, we, well, we were overseas for two years, and when we, uh, by the time the war was over, uh, and we had finally boarded ship to come back to the states, uh, as uh, you know, we were all we we couldn't wait to get home, and that morning it was early morning, and as we 
The ship glided past in the early morning fog, past the Statue of Liberty. There wasn't a dry eye aboard that ship. And this was, you know, thousands of enlisted men, of officers, nurses, every, every, every kind. But, you know, we were always told nurses don't cry, but believe me, nurses cried, everybody cried. It was so wonderful to see that Statue of Liberty.